Thanks, Jeremy. I forgot who was speaking. No worries. I was like, who's speaking? And I saw you looking around. You like, saw my face? Yeah, I, was I like, did. Oh, my God. I wasn't even sure if I was supposed to come up, but she was looking. <laughs> She's looking around, so I go, I guess that's my cue to go up. I guess. <laughs> yeah, good morning, Catalyst. I'm so happy to see all of you. Yeah, it's a it's an awesome morning. So thank you, Lord, for this morning, the the day that you have created, and we rejoice and we are glad in it, Lord. Yes. So um, we're going to be continuing our series. We started a series last week. Uh, it's called Relational Evangelism, and so we're going to continue with that series. And the reason why we call it Relational Evangelism is we've tried a lot of different things at Catalyst. Right. So, and then if you've been a Christian for a while, there's lots of things out there, right? You see some people on the side of the street holding signs. Um, you know, you tell people, like, just go tell people about Jesus. And we've kind of been honestly struggling with evangelism over the past few years and trying to just seek the Lord, like, what's right for us? And then, I don't know why, this was like a duh moment for us. So the duh moment was, we are a very relational church. And as a relational church, we don't want to just go out and just tell people about Jesus and bring them in and then turn them through and then throw them back out. And then, you know, that's not us, right? That's just not us. We're, we're also not necessarily the ones who stand on the side of the street picketing or, you know, putting up signs. Some churches do that. That's okay. That's their calling. That's the way the Lord has inspired them to evangelize. So for us, we discerned, you know, the way we really do it is through relationship. And that really is what our church is about. And that's really what our church was called to when we were planted many, many years ago. It's really relationship with God and relationship with people and learning how to love God and learning how to love people. So that's why this series is called Relational Evangelism. And I want to share with you a little bit about what I've learned. So, uh, but let me pray first. Let me pray first. So. Lord, I just thank you that, um, I thank you for the people here, Lord. I thank you for your church. I thank you for your sons and daughters, Lord. I thank you that you have chosen us to be your church, your beloved, your family, accepted, Lord, and just called, Lord, to um, rule and reign with you. You have chosen us to house your Holy Spirit um, and to just express your love to this world and also in truth and love, Lord. So, Lord, I just thank you for that. And we just bless you this morning, Lord. We bless you with our full hearts, Lord, and we receive your blessing over this congregation. Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, question for you. What is the scariest thing you've ever done in your life? The scariest thing you've ever done in your life. For some, maybe it was like a picture of their wedding day. <laughs> or for some, it was like when your first child was born. It's like, what am I going to do with that? Uh, or maybe for some, it was jumping out of an airplane, skydiving. Or maybe for some, it's standing up here and giving a sermon. <laughs> so when you look back on it or you think about it, was it as scary as you thought it was before you did it? Was it as scary as you thought it was going to be before you did it? And a lot of times we look back and we go, oh, that was easy. That wasn't that bad, right? So one of the scariest things that I started doing two years ago was I started going out to Venice Beach to evangelize. And it was scary. So in Mark 16, 15, which is a restatement of the Great Commission, from Matthew 28, 19, Jesus tells his disciples, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Okay? We are called to proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. But you know what? I've always thought of myself more as the teacher, the discipler, the educator. So in church, what I've always done is I've always kind of taught classes. I've always mentored Christian men. I've always been more on the teaching side. And then if we're down in Mexico building and they tell me to go knock door to door, I'll go do it. And if I'm overseas and they go, go tell people about Jesus, I'll be like, okay, I'll go, you know. Um, or if somebody asks me, what is the gospel? I'm happy to share it, right? So, so that's good enough, right? I teach at church, I love God, and then when people tell me to evangelize, I'll do it. 
So imagine my surprise. Two years ago, two years ago, I'm spending time with the Lord, and I'm just praying. And then I just say to the Lord, Lord, what more can I do for your kingdom? You know, I must have been in a really tender place when I asked that question. You know, Lord, what more can I do for your kingdom? I really want to see your kingdom grow. And immediately the Lord says to me, go to Venice and learn how to evangelize. And I'm like, so now I know somebody, right? So I have a, I have a acquaintance, not even a friend, but I have an acquaintance who's a missionary. And that's one of his things. He goes out every Sunday, he goes to Venice and he evangelizes. I don't know him well, uh, but immediately when I heard that from the Lord, I was like scared. I was like, no, no, you did not just ask me to do that, right? I was so fearful. I was so scared. I was like, I can't talk to strangers, you know? I don't, I don't talk to strangers. And then I was also uh, thinking to myself, the gospel is really hard to share in Southern California. Everybody's so comfortable and they love, you know, the things they have. It's really hard to share. And then on top of that, I have rejection wounds from high school, right? So it's like, I can't stand the rejection, right? So I'm making up all these excuses in my head. So I basically say no, but just in case I did hear from the Lord correctly, I said, Lord, if you really want me to go to evangelize in Venice, then have that missionary call me and invite me out to Venice. And I kind of scoffed. I was like, ha ha, because he doesn't have my phone number, I didn't think. <laughs> number two, I hadn't talked to him in over eight months. And number three, I only met him twice, and it was like 10 minutes, right? Like, hi, how are you, blah, 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 blah. So imagine my surprise. I'm sitting on my couch two days later. I'm just sitting here, and the phone's next to me, and it starts ringing. And I look down, and it's his name. It's this missionary's name on the phone. And I'm looking at it, and I'm shaking. And my son walks by, and I go, oh, shh, you know? <laughs> and my son's like, because I don't, I don't normally swear, right? So my son looks at me, and he's like, what? And I go, nothing. And then he goes, did somebody call on the phone? And I go, in my head, I'm thinking Jesus is calling, right? So, so you, what do I do? I send it to voicemail. Because <laughs> if I send it to voicemail, I don't have to deal with it, right? But then he texts me. He texts me. I get a text, and the text says, did you change your email address? Because my missionary letter kicked back. And I go, oh, okay. Here's my new email address, and then I'm polite, right? So I go, how are you, right? Does he tell me how he is? Do I get back, good, great, I'm not well, my marriage is wonderful. Do I get any, no, you know what I get back? Do you want to go out with me tomorrow to <laughs> Venice? That's what he texted me back when I asked him, how are you, right? And so I'm sitting here, I have, I'm at a crossroads. I'm like, what am I gonna do, right? And the fear sets in, say no, don't do it. And so immediately I know that's the enemy's voice, right? That's the enemy telling me that I can't do it and it's not the Lord. So what I do is I just type yes, I send send, and I don't think about it, okay? And that's the solution, really. When the enemy starts in, you ignore it you, and you say yes to whatever God is impressing on you, right? And I have to tell you, it was the best experience it was the best experience. I went out there, I met this booth. The booth says, Jesus loves you, free Bibles. My job is to look people in the eye, tell them Jesus loves them, ask them if they need prayer, ask them if they want a free Bible. And then it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them and bring them over or highlight them to me, right? So I'm doing that and that day, my first day, I prayed for five people, five different people and they were all Christians because that's what the Lord knew I could handle that day, five Christians, and I qualified them. I asked them, do you know Jesus? And they, t they had to tell me who Jesus was, and we prayed together, and it was best, you know, encouraging the church, blessing the church. I love doing that. So I go home. I'm like, I'm done. Yay. I did it. Yay. Okay. I don't have to go back again until a few weeks later, the Lord says, go back, and I'm like, oh. So I go back, and it was the second time that I actually got to share the gospel with somebody. And I got to share it with a, uh, a young guy in his 20s, his name was Michael, and uh, he was walking past me, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, do you need prayer? And he's like, what? And he just comes back. It was amazing. He just made like a 180, and he came back, and he goes, yeah, I think I do. And then I said, do you want a free Bible? He goes, sure. Takes the free Bible, and I say, okay, what do you need prayer for? So he tells me, and then I say, I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. Do you know Jesus? 
And he goes, I think so. I go, well, who's Jesus to you? And he goes, I really don't know, but there's this guy who comes in my dreams, and when I need it, he comforts me, and he told me his name is Jesus, but I don't know who that is. So I pull him aside, and I tell him. And as I'm telling him, he is, like, listening. And then at the end, I go, do you want to receive Jesus? Like that, like, kind of like, do you want to receive Jesus? And he goes, yes. And I go, y you do? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yes. So I go, okay, okay, um, there's this prayer I think we're supposed to do, right? So then I just say, okay, it's really just a heart thing. In your heart, you just have to say that you believe and that you're going to put your faith in him and that he is the Lord of your life. The guy's like, okay. So we pray, like we're doing this. And then when we're done, I look at him and he looks at me and I can't believe that he did it, right? And then he goes, Yay. <laughs> And I go, yay! <laughs> and then he goes, now what? <laughs> and I go, well, here, take a Bible, and I want you to read through Matthew. And then we're gonna, here's the address of a church, and I want you to contact them, and you need to start going there on Sundays and stuff like that. So anyways, that was my first experience, uh, actually sharing the gospel with a total stranger who received outside of doing it in Mexico, going door to door. So... What I learned is there's two things that I learned on Venice. And you know what it really was, was evangelism is wonderful. It's on the Lord's heart. He wants people to know. But he really wanted to grow me in how to do it and in my confidence. And the way he did it was so loving and so gentle, it's really through his heart, right? So what I learned, the first thing is I'm not doing it by myself. I am partnering with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who's doing it. So what I found out is the Holy Spirit, he does the hard work. He's the one reaching people. He's the one that made that guy turn back and come back and talk to me. He's the one that's softening hearts. He's opening eyes. And then I am just the available mouthpiece there for the Holy Spirit to share because they want to hear with their physical ears. And then the Holy Spirit convicts their heart. So I go, I'm not out there by myself. You're not out there by yourself. We're out there together partnering and the Holy Spirit is moving people's hearts all around us and opening eyes, okay? The second thing that I learned is that sharing Jesus and the good news with others is all about revealing the Father's heart. It's all about what Jody was talking about through prayer ministry. It works for us, and it's a lot of why we became believers in the first place, and it's so needed. The world needs a touch from Jesus and his Father's heart. And that is what's going to help them experience the Father. Okay? So in Matthew 9, 35, 38, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And when I go out there to Venice, that is what I see. I see a lot of people who are harassed and helpless, and they are looking for the good shepherd. And they find it in all sorts of different things. There's drugs, there's sex, there's all sorts of things out there that is leading them. But they are looking for the truth, and they feel harassed and helpless. <laughs> and then Jesus continues to say, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. We are the co-workers together and with the Holy Spirit, we're the partners. Okay. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into this harvest field. So I'm here begging you today, please be a worker in the harvest field. I'm asking the Lord to change our hearts to be workers in the harvest field. Okay. And what the Lord showed me is there is a acronym. You know, I can't get away without a sermon without having an acronym, right? That's my thing. So how do we partner with the Holy Spirit? We partner with the Holy Spirit to reveal the Father's heart to people by this acronym of ABLE. And what I found is the A stands for being alert and available. The B is bless, bless people. The L is listen, and the E is exchange. Okay. Jesus was able to reveal the Father's heart to others, and he uses this process um, and he's able to bring people into the kingdom through that. And as sons and daughters of God, 
in Christ Jesus, we can also partner and be able to share the Father's heart to a world that so desperately needs it. Okay. One of the best examples I've seen of Abel through um, Jesus' modeling is in John 4, 1 through 42. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John 4, 1 through 42, and we're going to be talking about the woman at the well, when he meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And it's a great example of how Jesus does it. <clears throat> All right, so if you have your Bibles, turn your Bibles. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through 1 through 42, but I'm not going to show every verse because it is a long passage. So if you have your um, app with you, it's helpful to kind of read through it for yourself too. So I just want to give you a little bit of background here about the woman at the well. Um, it starts here in John 4, 1 through uh, 5. When Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He traveled through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Suhar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Okay, So where is Suhar? So let me see if we have the map here. trying to find it. Oh, okay. Let me explain it to you then. So Israel is kind of, kind of has three provinces in it, three major provinces when you think of um, ancient Israel. In the south is Jerusalem. Okay. Jerusalem is where the temple is, and that area is called Judea. So when they say he's in Judea, he's actually in Jerusalem where the temple is and where the Pharisees are. The Pharisees are the Jewish ruling council. Okay. Up in the north, where Jesus is actually from, it's an area called um, Galilee, Galilee. And Jesus is from an area there called Nazareth, and then he actually settles in a city called Capernaum. Okay? So that area is called Galilee. It's 100 miles between Jerusalem and between Galilee. So he's traveling now from Judea to Galilee, which is 100 miles on foot. But in order to get there, he has to go through this middle area called Samaria. And Samaria is home to the Samaritans. Who are the Samaritans? So the Samaritans are 10 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they settled there. But when the Assyrians came and conquered them, they intermixed with the Assyrians. And not only did they intermix with the Assyrians, they started bringing in their rituals, their religious rituals in. So Samaritans, from Jewish standards, they're considered unclean, intermixed, half-breeds, who only believe in the first five books, only believe in the Torah, and they have, um, there we go, there's the map, and they have um, brought in other rituals. So there is really bad blood between the two groups. It's so bad, in fact, in 100 BC, the Jews in the south went up and they destroyed the temple that the Samaritans worshipped at, at Mount Gerizim in uh, Samaria. There was two, t two different temples at the time and the Jews in the south went and destroyed the Samaritans' temples. So there is bad blood between these two groups. They do not talk, they do not associate. Okay? And so that's where we see the context of Jesus meeting this woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Okay? So if you uh, look at your Bibles here, you can see in John 4, 6 through 8, that Jesus is demonstrating the first day. He is alert and he is available. In John 4, 6 through 8, it says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon, so it's hot. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Okay. So last week, my son Noah was up here, and he was talking about being alert and available to what the Holy Spirit's pointing out. Right? And he was sharing about how we ministered to a guy at McDonald's when we were going through. But what he didn't share with you was what my day had looked like. So I want to talk about my day. <laughs> so my day looked like this. I woke up at 6.30. I took my two kids. I took the two neighborhood kids. We got in the car. We drove to Redondo Beach. They went to an all-day speech and debate uh, camp. I kind of helped out at the camp. I ran errands. Agnes was with me. She was working remotely. So I got her lunch. I ran her errands. So by 4 o'clock, I was done and ready to go home and Friday night, two hours to get home from Redondo Beach to Los Alamitos. Pick up the boys in the car. They are hangry, 
hangry. They are hungry, angry, hangry. And they're fighting in the back of the car. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Right? Go to McDonald's. So we go to McDonald's, and it's in that drive through Just before I'm about to pull in the drive through that's where I see that man. And he's just sitting on a curb, and he's just hunched over, and he looks sad. And honestly, I think he was drunk, too. And in that moment, that's when I felt the compassion of the Father over this man. And I don't always feel that for people. So the Lord highlights them to me, and then I feel that, and I felt that helplessness from him, and I felt the shepherd's heart for wanting to bring back one of his lost sheep. So that's when I rolled the window down, and I said to that man, are you okay? And the man says, no. And I said, could we at least get you a meal from McDonald's? And he said, yes. And that's how we met the man, and that's how we heard his story and interacted with him, and that's how we had a chance to pray for him um, and um, hopefully help him rededicate his life back to Christ. Um, and then we got in the car, and you know what? It was still a two-hour drive home, but it felt like 15 minutes, and there was peace in the car, and there was laughter in the car on the way home, right? So different, different car ride. So I don't know what happened to that man, but I do know that in the moment, God was asking us to partner with him so the man could remember and feel the Father's heart again through us. Okay? So we can be alert and available wherever we go, wherever we are. We can be on the lookout and not just be about what we want to accomplish. That's how I am most of the time. I'm like, I have 10 things on my list. I need to get through this line. I'm the one at Costco trying to find the shortest line. Like, where do, where, you know? And then what I found a lot of times is the line I pick, there's something there. Maybe I'm supposed to talk to the person in front of me or behind me, or maybe it's the person that's kind of doing the checkout, you know? But a lot of times the Lord has something going on, and I just need to be alert and available, okay? So the second thing that we see Jesus do is be, we see him bless. We see him bless. You know, blessing is one of the cores of the Father's heart, and we see it from the beginning of Genesis, right? Right from the beginning of Genesis, God blesses the sea creatures, he blesses the birds, and he blesses us because he always has the very best for his creation, especially his children. So he calls us to bless others, and he calls us to bless the things that he's doing. Okay? So continuing with John 4, 9 through 15, Jesus blesses the Samaritan woman by seeing her through the Father's heart and by acknowledging her and letting her know that he sees her, that she was worthy to be seen and interacted with and even worthy to be known. In fact, the Samaritan woman, she's surprised. She says to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Okay? This was a really big deal back then. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So why is this a blessing for the Samaritan woman? Because she is considered the lowest and lowest of society. First, she's a Samaritan. So she's unclean, half brain intermixed. She's a woman. So she has very little, no rights. Third, she is a sinful woman. So she has been shunned by her own people. She's been married five times and she's living in sin with, with somebody right now. And on top of that, Jesus is known as a Jewish rabbi. Jewish rabbis are not allowed to talk to women in public. Right? So people read through this in the Bible and they go, oh, because they look at it through the lens of today. This is revolutionary. He came to break those barriers down to show the Father's heart to a Samaritan woman who becomes the first evangelist in the Bible. That is amazing to me. So who around you is craving a blessing by God and a touch from Jesus? Who around you at the grocery store, the doctor's office, school, work, even on the street, who feels unseen, ignored, written off, struggling, desperate? We, as children of God, who have his favor and his blessing, we can bless people, we can bless strangers. We could do it with a smile. We could do it with a nod. We could do it with, hello, how are you? We can bless them by taking the time to talk to them, see what they need, buy them some food, bring them a drink, pray for them, or bless them in the name of Jesus, okay? So one time I took my mom, 
who, uh, my mom had just had open, open heart surgery, and she had four, four um, things replaced, and I took her to the urgent care because she couldn't breathe. And she's like, I can't breathe, so I take her to the urgent care, and when we get in there, it's six o'clock at night. Anybody been to an urgent care six o'clock at night? <laughs> it's packed, wall to wall, right? It's packed. I get in there, and the receptionist is like, have a seat. I don't know when they're going to call you, but all these people were here before you. So I'm like, oh, so now I'm hangry. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, we're going to be here all night. And then I look across from me, and sitting in a chair across from me is a mom, a young mom, and a young boy, about five years old. And the boy is laying down on his mother's lap, and he's sweating, and he's coughing. And you could see people are, like, giving their, like, barrier distance, right, from this boy. And in that moment, I could feel the father's heart wanting to bless that boy and just wanting to touch him. So I get up, and I go over there, and I say to the mom, is he okay? And she goes, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's had this fever for many days. He's been coughing, and she just sounds desperate. And as she's sharing with me, I just really feel this desperation coming from her. And I say to her, can I pray for you and your son? And she says, okay. So I sit down, and I just put my hands on them. And, you know, my mom is across the room, and she's looking at me like, don't do that. You know, you're going to get sick, right? <laughs> don't do that. That is dirty, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm sorry. They, they, they just need to be prayed for. And I just pray for them. And I pray for peace. I pray for hope. I pray for restoration. I pray for the living water of Jesus just flowing through them. And then I could just see the mother's face just starting to kind of, you know, the anxiety's kind of going away. And then just as I'm about to wrap up my prayer, I hear the door open and the nurse comes out and she calls my mom's name. So I get up and I take my mom in and I bless the lady. We had only waited 15 minutes in the urgent care and they called us in. I was like, whoa, thank you, Jesus. Right. So who around you needs a blessing? I wish I, I wish I had the opportunity to actually share the gospel with that woman, but it didn't turn out that way. But I'm pretty sure a gospel seed was either sown or it was watered that day, and the Lord would send somebody else from our family to come and minister her to to further it. Okay? So, next one is L. L stands for listen. And what we see next is Jesus is listening to the Samaritan woman. In fact, he is listening to her from the moment he sees her, maybe even before time. And what he's hearing from her is he's hearing the needs of her heart. She is carrying some deep burdens from not only being shunned by society, but some deep burdens from having to go to that well by herself and also having to go at noon when it's hot. She's also carrying some deep burdens about her people, the Samaritans and the Jews, and this confusion. What, you know, we worship here, you worship there, you hate us, you came and you destroyed our temple, we hate you, but you're asking me for water, and you know, she's, she's got all this stuff going on. And Jesus hears it, and he says to her, go call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband. And she replied, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this place where we must worship in Jerusalem. And so what he's doing is he's hearing not just what she's saying, not just her physical, but she's, he's hearing the emotional stuff happening and he can see in her spirit. She needs living water from him and a touch from the Father's heart. Listening is about hearing and hearing what the Lord wants you to know about this person and what this person is going through. It's about asking questions. It's about being curious. It's about what they're thinking, what they're feeling, how they're seeing things, and it's doing with gentleness and respect. Okay. Nowhere here does it say Jesus condemned her. Nowhere does it say, Jesus said, oh, you got five husbands? Oh, and the one you're living with now is not even your husband? What, girl? You know, he's not doing that, right? He is gentle, he is respectful, and he pulls it up. He's talking about the bigger things that's going on inside of her, not the outside stuff, 
or even the bad choices that she's made. And it's about listening to what the Holy Spirit is showing us about this person. Okay? So I just want to share with you a couple things that I've learned in Venice as I've been talking to people. Uh, what I found is when I ask people, how are you? I am going to get good, tired, busy. There's lots going on. Okay? If I ask them, what's going on with you? Or if I say, what's your story? Or how did you get here? what I'm going to hear is what's really going on with them. And you know what? People will tell you everything. <laughs> if they know you truly want to listen and you ask them what's going on, they will tell you. Okay. The second most helpful phrase I've learned when I'm there is, what do you mean by that? Not, what do you mean by that? But, <laughs> what do you mean by that? You know? And what that basically is, it's an invitation to share how they see things. How do you see it? And to ask them, how'd you get there? Or where did that come from? And people will share lots with you about what they believe, what they assume, and why they believe that or assume that. And I just listen. I just listen. I'm not there to necessarily judge. Right? And from there, I ask the Lord, show me, Lord, what's going on with them. Show me how I can pray for them and minister to their heart. Okay? So the L is for listen, and Jesus does just such an awesome job, such a masterful job of that. Okay? And then the last one is E for exchange. So... You know what, I just really love having Bruce in the audience because I feel so affirmed. If you're in the back and you can't hear Bruce, everything I'm saying to you, Bruce is like, yes, hallelujah, amen. It's just like, it's, it is so encouraging. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for sitting in the front. It really just, you know. So anyways, the E is for exchange. <laughs> and so finally, what Jesus does is he does an exchange with the Samaritan woman. And what an exchange is, he can tell that she's carrying lies. She's carrying fears. She's carrying burdens. And he's there to take that and to give her the truth in love. And that's an exchange. When we can sense that people are believing things that or have fear, and you know they want to release that and they want to hear the truth in love. That's an exchange that we can help facilitate. With, uh, with the Holy Spirit, okay? And so she's got fears, she's got burdens, she's got stripes, she's got lies, she feels insignificant, and her heart is weighing down also. And she says, the Messiah will tell me all of this when he comes. And what Jesus does is Jesus takes all that and he says to her, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. He says to her, it doesn't matter if it's Jerusalem. It doesn't matter if it's Mount Gerizim. It's not about location. It's not about rituals. It's not about what you've been taught. It's about your heart. God sees your heart and he wants worshipers who worship in the spirit and in truth. And then he reveals himself to her. And he says, I am the one, I am speak, I the one speaking to you, I am he, the Messiah. And with that, her eyes are opened and her heart is like unlocked because of that exchange with Jesus. So it's amazing, right? So as children of God, we have experienced an exchange with God. We have exchanged our former life. We have exchanged our troubles. We have exchanged our worries, our anxieties, even our past sins. We have exchanged all that for his goodness, his grace, his love, and for his sonship as his sons and daughters. And we can go and we can also help facilitate those exchanges with who the Holy Spirit is highlighting to us. Okay? So one time I met a man. He was sitting in a wheelchair. I was going to the grocery store. I needed to pick up some milk for the kids. I, I met a man and he was sitting in a wheelchair kind of to the side and he was about 300 pounds. 300 pounds, he was wearing shorts, and he had the biggest legs I've ever seen. His, his calves must have been swollen to about three times mine. His ankles were gigantic, and his feet, the whole thing was just swollen, and he's sitting there in his wheelchair, barely able to fit. And I see him, but I'm going in the door, and he's over here, and I look at him, and then I just smile at him, and I nod, and then he smiles, and he nods back. So I go over there, and I say, Hey, I'm going to the store. Do you need anything? And he says, I would love some instant coffee. OK, 
okay, this is where I didn't have to judge, right? No judgment, instant coffee, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so I was like, what do you need? He goes, instant coffee. I said, okay. He goes, get, could you buy me the generic one? Like, just, just don't get me anything fancy and give me a small jar. And I go, I can get you better. And he's like, no, 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 just a small jar. And I go, what else do you need? He goes, that's all I want. Every morning, I just need a little bit to pick me up and get me out of bed. I said, okay. I go in there. I found exactly what he wanted. I got him a bigger jar. I came out, and I gave it to him. And you would have thought I gave the man 100 bucks. He was so happy. He's like beaming from ear to ear, right? But then I say to the man, how'd you get here? What are you doing out here? And he tells me his whole story. He tells me how two years earlier, um, during COVID, he woke up one day and he couldn't get out of bed. He woke up one day and he couldn't get out of bed. And when he took the sheets off, his legs were just swollen. His legs were swollen and he didn't feel well. So from there, he went to the doctors, tried to get tests. They couldn't figure out what was going on with him. Had to go on disability. After his disability ran out, he got fired. After he got fired, he didn't have an income. So they took his house. So then he became homeless. When he became homeless, his wife said, I didn't sign up for this, I'm out of here. And so she divorced him. And then now he's living in a transitional housing place. Right? So then I said to him, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you went through all that. That sounds horrible. And then I said, can I pray for you? And he said, yes, I would love that. And I said, I'm gonna pray in the name of Jesus. And he goes, yes. And I said, do you know who Jesus is? And he says to me, Jesus is my savior. He's my Messiah. He has rescued me from everything. He has paid the penalty for my sins. And, I, and then he says, but I'm losing hope because my situation hasn't changed. And I said, we're gonna pray right now. So I get down on my knees and I put my hands out and we're praying over his calves, and I'm praying for healing and restoration and from a touch from the Lord. And I honestly wish I could say that he just jumped up and he was healed and he ran down the street. I mean, that would be amazing, and that's what I want to see. But that's not what happened that day. What happened is we kept praying and praying, and then I could see the Lord touching his heart. And as I look up at him, there's tears that are rolling down his eyes, and he's crying. And I could see that the Lord is ministering to him. And then something else amazing actually happened. He had, a, he had a little uh, can next to him that I didn't see, but others walking in and outside. So as I was praying for him, people started coming over and they started putting money into his can. I was like, whoa. And then I look over and there's a lady over by the shopping carts and she's putting her hand out and she's praying with me also, right? So I'm like, oh, well, something's happening here. Okay, well, I'm just gonna go with it and see what happens, right? So then we finish and he says, thank you so much. I really needed that touch from the Lord today. Thank you, right? And with that, I kind of felt like my assignment was done. But there was an exchange there. He was a believer, but he was, there was a seed of hopelessness, a seed of, of disbelief in the Lord's goodness. And it was through that prayer that there was an exchange and that the Holy Spirit came in through that exchange and ministered to him and grew his faith and grew his hope again. And so I don't know what happened to that man. I haven't seen him again. This was about a year ago, but um, I'm pretty sure that the Lord is working good things out for him. Yeah. So that's the acronym. The acronym is ABLE. So it's being alert and available wherever we go, being ready to bless however the Lord wants us to bless. It's listening, listening. And a lot of that just is holding back our own opinions. And then E is exchanging, looking to see where are they carrying something that the Lord doesn't want them to carry, a lie or a fear or a burden. And where can we help facilitate an exchange where the Holy Spirit can come in and do that, exchange it for the truth in love, okay? And so what's the result when we step out like that? What's the result of when Jesus did it? And I love this. This is the best part. This is the best part. John 44, 39 through 41. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She went off and she ran. She became the first evangelist. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said 
Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Okay? And we are able to do the same thing. We are able to carry that father's heart so people feel that touch and they say, I believe. Okay? And Jesus reminds us again, when you go up a little bit to John 4, 35 to, 35 to 38, he reminds his disciple and he teaches them. He says, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they do the hard work. Others have done the hard work, but we get to reap and we get to benefit in the labor because that's how much he loves us. Okay. I went out to Venice a few, uh, last month, last month I went and um, I had so much oppression. I came to church that day and I just, I wanted to go home and crawl into bed, honestly, but I knew I was supposed to go. And that day was the youth service and I went up and I asked um, Sean, Sean Kim, Sean Arakaki, and um, Josh Lachika, and um, Brandon, Brandon Lee. I asked them to pray for me. And I came up there and I said, I, I'm called to go and evangelize today, but I just wanna go home and throw the blanket over my head. And I need prayer. And the three of them prayed for me. And it was, the most gentle but powerful prayer from youth that I ever experienced. And I immediately felt the lifting, right? And I, and I had the energy to go and I went. And that day there was three salvations. Three salvations that we share in Christ and we share with the youth. And three doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I just wanna share with you, there is a lot more coming, okay? Three was the most I've seen and we gave out over 50 Bibles that day and we probably prayed for over 25 people and three received. In my time going out there, which has maybe been a dozen times, I have never seen that much activity. And it tells me that there is a time coming very, very near where the Holy Spirit's gonna be working even more actively. If the fields are ripe now, they are gonna be like ready for harvesting, completely ready, right? So my message to you is, Gear up, get ready, start now. Learn how to be able to carry the Father's heart because there's a time coming. We've seen it starting in other parts of the country. We've seen it in other parts of the world. There's a time coming and the Lord is calling you to partner with him, to partner with him to um, bring the harvest in so we can rejoice together. Yeah, amen, amen. All right, here's a few action steps for you. The first action step is to be alert and available. So this week when you're in line or if you're waiting or you're running an errand, just pause for a few minutes and just look around and ask the Holy Spirit, who do you want me to highlight or who do you want to highlight, okay? You don't have to go up to them. You don't have to go up to them or say anything. Just see if the Holy Spirit is showing you anybody, okay? Um, the second one is bless or pray. So during this last worship set, um, go up to somebody that maybe you don't know very well and just ask them what's going on in their life and then ask if you can pray or if you can bless them. And it could be simple, a simple blessing, a simple prayer. It could just be, I bless you in the name of Jesus, okay? Uh, the L is listen. So this week, go and find somebody and ask them to share their story with you. Maybe a neighbor, a friend, a coworker. Ask them what's going on with your life and just listen. Listen to what's going on with them and then listen to what the Lord is highlighting to you about them. And then the last one is exchange, okay? If you're sitting here today and you're like, I want to do this, I wanna be able to carry the Father's heart, but you're in a place where you feel like you need a touch from the Father's heart, then I just invite you to come up during this last worship set. And the prayer ministers that were up here before, they will um, pray for you and you can receive and experience the Father's heart for you personally. As they're praying for you, I want you to listen for that Father's heart. What, is, what are the prayer ministers saying to you? What's the Holy Spirit telling you? And what's happening in your heart from the Father, okay? So, and worship team, why don't you come on up? And I just wanna conclude by saying, we are a blessed people, we are favored, and the harvest is ripe, and the Lord has done the hard work. We are able to go and share the Father's heart. 
So let me pray for us. Yeah. Um, Father God, Lord, I just thank you, Lord. I just, I just thank you that you are a God who chooses to bestow his love and his grace on all of us, Lord. And you carry that same love, that same grace for all those around us, Lord. For, for all the men and the women who are created in your image, Lord. And you just have a longing and desire for them to truly know who you are and to experience your Father's heart, Lord. So Lord, I just pray right now over our body here at Catalyst, Lord. I just pray for an empowering of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I just pray that you would break any oppression you would break any chains. You would break any fears that we carry that say that we can't do this. Lord, I just pray that you would bring to mind and to memory of all the ways that you have touched everybody's lives here and you have shown your goodness and your love and your grace over them, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, for an empowerment of your spirit and for your strength and courage and boldness over us. And I pray to a reminder that we don't go alone. We go with the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit's doing the hard work, and we're there partnering and sharing and rejoicing, Lord. So I just bless the people here in your name, Lord, and I give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our online service. Hope you will join us in person sometime. It'll be great to see you and meet you. Don't forget to subscribe to our Catalyst YouTube channel so you don't miss out on anything. And be blessed this week. And as always, thank you, Jesus.